Yes. Okay. Chapter 14. So we're going to talk about a little bit about um, biological diversity. Species. Okay, so speciation is this process of how um, these species become multiple species. And uh, do you guys remember what is a species? We... So when, <laughs> when, when you have individuals being able to interbreed with one another to produce fertile offsprings, that's the definition of a species. So that's within a population, of course. However, there are exceptions to this rule because th not everything reproduces um, sexual, has sexual reproduction. Some uh, undergo asexual reproduction. So for those, they don't really, I mean, they're still called a species, but it's not this definition of that species. Uh, also, there's a uh, fossil record that we ended up obtaining, and we don't know for sure how they reproduced. So we're going to end up um, also just determining by what we know so far about them to um, categorize them under a species name. Does that make sense what species means? So whatever the individuals within that population, they could uh, have sexual reproduction to produce their offsprings. And those offsprings, if they're able to reproduce, uh, then that will be categorized under a species. So usually there's these reproductive barriers that will cause uh, speciations to occur. Uh, well, a lot of the evolutionary species that um, have evolved uh, usually undergo this uh, due to the reproductive barriers that are involved. And so reproductive barriers, like the name implies, are these barriers that prevent um, interbreeding between individuals. They're a prezygotic barrier. Um, a zygote is when you have a fertilized egg. So when it talks about a prezygotic barrier, then this is a barrier before that fertilization occurs. Uh, so uh, before you end up forming that zygote. So usually it does it uh, either before the mating ritual occurs or the fertilization occurs. There are these ones that we'll talk about. Temporal, ha habitat, behavioral, and mechanical uh, isolation. These are all prezygotic barriers. And then there's postzygotic, oh, and also gametic isolation. And then there's postzygotic barriers. And like the name implies, this occurs after forming a zygote. So after fertilization has occurred already. Uh, usually these hybrids uh, will not be fertile or will have certain deformity is to prevent it from um, reproducing anymore. And we'll talk about that. And there's these three, uh, reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid vi uh, viability, um, oh, sorry, I just said it twice, <laughs> viability, uh, repro being able to be fertile to reproduce, and also uh, the breakdown of it too. So let's start off with the prezygotic barriers. Okay, what does prezygotic mean again? Yeah, before a zygote is formed, before fertilization occurs, there's these barriers. First one is temporal isolation. Temporal, what does temporal mean? Uh, time, time related. So this is a difference between the timing of um, a the two different individuals uh, when they're mating. So for example, we have this these different type of skunk species here. We have this um, western spotted skunk, which breeds in the fall. However, the eastern spotted skunk actually breeds during the winter, late winter. So the breeding seasons are different, and if they're different, they're not going to be breeding amongst each other, and so uh, this is a barrier preventing them from breeding with each other. Does that make sense? So there's a timing issue here that prevents them from breeding with each other. 
Habitat isolation. This is when a population lives in different habitats um, that will prevent them from uh, mating with one another. And the example here is these garter snakes. This one garter snake on the left here uh, mostly lives in the water, while this one here mostly lives on the land. So since they're living in different locations, different habitats, they're not going to be able to interact with each other to um, uh, undergo mating. Behavioral isolation is when there's certain um, organisms that will undergo a behavioral reproduction. So they will un do either through order or through color schemes or court ro uh, courtship rituals like this uh, uh, blue-footed boobies here that they will undergo these rituals and they might not be recognized by other um, other organisms so they wouldn't know that uh, they are ready to be um, undergo reproduction. So if they don't recognize it then they're not going to mate with them. So and I had a peacock here as well because they also undergo these rituals as well. Mechanical isolation, this is when the mating structures themselves do not fit so that um, they not, are not able to reproduce. If they're incompatible with each other, then they're not being able to reproduce. So uh, I put a little picture of this little child here. Uh, <laughs> you know how, how you have those toys where you're trying to fit the shapes in the uh, bucket? Um, and if, it, if you're fitting a triangle inside a square hole, it doesn't fit, right? So it's kind of the same uh, mechanism in this uh, case scenario. So if like the penis doesn't fit uh, the female's vagina, uh, then it's not going to, they're not going to be able to reproduce. So in this case scenario here on the upper left hand corner here, uh, this is showing the two snail species. And you notice that their shells are spiraled in different directions. And due to that spiraling of different directions, they are different species because their um, reproductive organs are not being able to um, uh, fit within, within each other and so they can't reproduce. Finally, we have gametic isolation. And gametes are sex cells. Um, I think we talked about that before at some point in time, yes? Okay. Um, so what are the sex cells? Males are sperm, females, eggs. Okay, yeah, eggs. Uh, and so, um, so this gametic isolation is when these gametes are not able to be fertilized. So even though they have sperm and eggs, those sperm and eggs, when they intermingle with each other, won't produce a fertile zygote at the end. So um, it won't be able to fertilize the egg. The sperm won't be able to fertilize that particular egg. So the example here, we have a sea urchin, which, you know, they produce sperms and eggs themselves. Um, and if they uh, expel their sperm and eggs inside the external environment, the sperm usually, if it's the same species, will fertilize the egg to, uh, to make a zygote. However, if they're different species, like over here, although there is sperm and eggs in the same location, that sperm won't be able to fertilize that egg, so you won't be able to produce a zygote. Make sense? Okay, so those are all pre-zygotic barriers. Post-zygotic barriers occurs after fertilization occurs. So first off is this reduced hybrid viability. Viable means uh, whether or not it's uh, able to survive or be living. And so uh, these hybrids tend to die before they become a re a reproductively mature. So uh, like the salamander here. Um, so the salamander species, they end up dying. They, they are formed, but they die before they are sexually mature to be able to pass down the, their genes onto the next generation. 
And we talked about this also in class before too. This hi a reduced hybrid fertility is when you have a hybrid um, between two different species forming a hybrid, and this hybrid is infertile in itself. And we talked about this before where we have a horse mating with a donkey to form a mule. However, the mule is not fertile, so it won't be able to reproduce. And same thing as this uh, tiglon over here, where a tiger mated with a lion to form this tiglon. Mm -hmm. Liger, yeah. Sink. Finally, we have a hybrid breakdown, and this is where uh, you have these uh, different species mating together to perform, uh, to produce a hybrid, and this hybrid actually does produce offsprings. Uh, so. As you can see here, these are the offsprings of the uh, these are the hybrid offsprings. However, um, these hybrid offsprings, when they they are able to produce offsprings themselves, so their offspring tends to be very is either sterile or feeble. In this particular case, these hybrid uh, rice plants uh, produce offsprings, but these offsprings once again are too weak uh, or are infertile or sterile, so they're not able to continue on uh, reproducing. So does that make sense? Yeah, hi, the hybrid breakdown. So if we're talking about the mule, right? We already said that the mule is sterile, right? It's not able to reproduce. This hybrid breakdown is saying that if the mule is capable of reproducing and has a child, those children of that mule cannot reproduce though. Uh, another mule kind of thing. So the hybrid, uh, this, these are two hybrid um, plants that reproduce with each other to form an offspring, but that offspring can't reproduce anything. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. So it's uh, as if you had a mule mating with another mule and it does produce an offspring, but that offspring of that mule cannot produce an offspring. Okay. Uh, for I would think so. Either gender will it'll be applicable as well. Of course, this mule the example I'm giving as an analogy to make it m make more sense. This the mule itself is sterile, so it cannot produce offspring. So the mule one is this reduced hybrid fertility. This hybrid breakdown is um, this rice plant that we were talking about. It's the hybrid itself. They can produce offsprings, but those offsprings of the hybrids cannot produce offsprings. <laughs> Are you guys confused or no? Okay. Uh, maybe if I drew it out. <laughs> So just say that there's a species one rice plant crossed with species two rice plant, right? It makes a hybrid rice plant, okay? This hybrid rice plant, when we cross it with another hybrid rice plant, does make an offspring, okay? It's also a hybrid, but it cannot produce produce any more offspring. It's a dead end there. So the difference is like when we're talking about the reduced hybrid fertility is when we have species one crossed with species two over here. So we make this hybrid mule, right? However, this hybrid mule, even if you try to reproduce it with another hybrid, they will not produce an offspring at all. Okay. Versus this hybrid breakdown is a breakdown. They are able to produce an offspring, but those offsprings cannot yeah. produce offsprings. So it's broken down. Okay, there's different ways of causing speciation. 
One is this allopatric speciation, and this is when there's some kind of geographic, uh, geographic barrier that is involved that isolates two populations. Um, so it prevents gene flow. Do you guys remember what gene flow is? Yeah, last week's. <laughs> it's where you end up being able to still have um, intermingling with each other um, between the two populations. I showed you guys a picture of these birds that are able to migrate over the mountains to uh, still uh, bring their traits to that population to increase um, genetic variety over there. Uh, but if you prevent gene flow, then they're really are isolated. So here's the allopatric speciation where this mountain divides this population up from this population. So usually it's a mountain, stream, or the founder's effect. What is founder's effect again? Correct. Uh -huh. It's moving to a new location where they end up um, not existing before, and but it's a small population that goes into that um, new location. So over here we have two different type of squirrels here uh, and they're divided through uh, either side of the Grand Canyon and because of that div division of the Grand Canyon they are not able to intermingle with each other forming two different species of this squirrel. Okay. So definitely those with smaller population tends to be affected more due to the fact that if you have um, smaller populations, your gene pool is not that um, numerous, uh, different type of variety. So you're very um, limited to the amount of traits and alleles in that particular population. So if there's some kind of mutation or some kind of um, natural selection uh, tends to affect that small sample size a, a lot more than if it's a huge population. If it's a huge population, even if there is some sort of mutation, it's not going to cause that big of an effect across the entire population itself. Sympatric speciation is when you end up having a new species form uh, without any kind of geographic barrier, so such as this uh, over here. One way of doing this is this polyploidy effect. This is uh, when you end up having more and more uh, chromosomes, either due to some kind of error within the cell division, which we'll later uh, learn about, like meiosis um, occurs, and or a hybridization that occurs. So th this will uh, prevent them from breeding with their parents. So for example, here we have one species of wheat over here is another species of wheat over here and when they made it they produce a hybrid species. This hybrid species then undergoes cellular division and then there's some kind of uh, error that causes it to actually have double the amounts of uh, that particular chromosome. So the, now that we have more than n the normal amount of chromosomes. Uh, Due to the fact when they're, uh, when the cells themselves divide, they end up um, cr not creating, but they don't divide perfectly even so that um, we have more chromosomes in a particular cell than another. Um, and so when we have more cells uh, than uh, that particular species here, we'll be able to mate with another species to end up uh, forming another sterile hybrid. But if that sterile hybrid undergoes that uneven division of uh, cell division, where uh, it causes, once again, a du duplication or extra chromosomes to be involved, like over here, now we have the common wheat, bread wheat that we actually have. Okay, so this, this actually underwent two times where it ended up having extra chromosomes than it's supposed to have. It's supposed to only have two, like these ones here. It's supposed to only have two. However, over here and over here, they actually ended up having more chromosomes than they ought to have. And due to some error with when they're do cell, due to some error when they're dividing, the cells are dividing. Um, 
And because there's more of these chromosomes, uh, they're able to actually form a new species. And this is the wheat that we eat in our bread. And um, yeah, it's kind of like a mistake. But we kind of uh, cultivated that mistake. You know, uh, as humans, we cultivated it and domesticated the wheat so that uh, it becomes the wheat that we now eat and bread and. In my current in corn too, yeah, uh, I don't know for sure, but I think so too. Okay, and also um, the sympatric speciation can also occur when uh, you're having a particular species that will start to try to exploit resources within different habitats. Um, so uh, we kind of talked about that garter snake earlier on, where one garter snake lives in the water while the other one lives on land. Um, due to, if there's too much competition in the land and they uh, are one type of uh, garter snakes has more beneficial traits in living in water and starts living in water and then um, uh, by doing that they end up um, utilizing this a different habitat but in the same area and um, end up becoming a different species. Okay, so evolutionary development biology, or just evil devo, uh, these people end up studying uh, the evolution of the development process of organisms. So one of the things that they'll uh, look at are the homeotic, uh, home homeotic genes. And these homeotic genes actually controls how organisms develop. Sometimes, uh, uh, when there's some kind of thing that ends up causing uh, these homeotic genes to duplicate, uh, it might end up forming a different type of species. Uh, in this particular case, uh, those that are invertebrates, like a crab here, um, they have just a, a standardized uh, homeotic genes. However, the vertebrates were formed due to a duplication of the homeotic genes and uh, vertebrates are those with backbones uh, like flounder here has a backbone um, and us as well and so this duplication of the homeotic genes forms this uh, backbone and then giving us the vertebrates versus invertebrates. There's also this pedomorphosis. Um, this pedomorphosis is basically uh, the definition of it is to help us retain um, juvenile features. So for example, this oxytal here is a salamander. And you'll notice that on its uh, lateral sides here, they have external gills. These external gills are present in juvenile salamanders generally speaking, but when those salamanders end up going into adulthood, they lose those external gills. Uh, however, this oxytal, um, does, even if it's an adult, it still has these gills, these external gills. So uh, it just retains these juvenile features then. Can that happen in humans? Well, actually, we're going to talk about how humans actually are they retain their own ju juvenile features. So when we're looking at uh, the human skull, uh, chimpanzee skulls, when they're juvenile, looks very similar to a human fetal skull as well. As the chimpanzee develops into adult, they uh, their jaw becomes a lot elongated and larger, and their brows as well. However, if you notice the human head, it looks very similar to its fetal skull. So, I mean, it's developed somewhat, but uh, it's not as developed as the chimpanzee skull. Um, not only that, like the process of the brain continuing to increase in size um, and growing and stuff, uh, even until adulthood, is kind of like a juvenile feature in itself. Because as we're growing from child to adulthood, of course, uh, the brain has to also grow as well. Well, with the chimpanzee, it can only grow so much because its cranial space is a lot smaller than um, the human skull itself. And so it's going to stop growing. So it, adult features is the um, stoppage of the growing of the brain in itself. 
However, for humans, we continue to have our brains grow all the way until uh, we hit puberty or so. And even then, we're, we're still like developing a little bit uh, of our brains as well. And um, so we retain that growing features of our brain. So that's still a juvenile feature uh, that we still have. So both our skull in itself and also the brain development. Uh, I don't think it would fit, to be honest. I think. Our, oh, I see. You're saying when they're developing and stuff like that. I don't think we've gotten to the uh, capabilities of doing that. But I mean, I'm sure if we had, that, that it would be very controversial too, right? Uh, as well. <laughs> Yeah, it would be very controversial, and plus um, whether or not, you know, the immune system of the chimpanzee, will they reject the human brain? So there's a lot of um, difficulties involved, but, and also like uh, ethical, um, possible ethical reasons involved as well. But no, I, I don't think they've tried that yet. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. is external, like it seems to be kind of like their epidermis or at least part of their outer skin. Uh -huh. And some of the descriptions you're giving for humans is skeletal. Um, does it apply to every sense of a juvenile feature? Like, or could we say like keeping your ears is the same? Right? Or um, at what point do you, like how do you distinguish between what's a juvenile feature and what's just... I think you know, you're looking at, when you're looking at something like that, you're looking more as um, not only in that particular species, but beyond that, like more of your ancestry as well. Um, or it's more wider than just a species. If you're looking at a specific species, of course, uh, us being adults, it's not a juvenile feature. It's um, when we. I mean, when we have that increased uh, cranial and increase in growing in our brains, that's just how we normally develop. And so that's a part of our adult features, you know, kind of thing. But when it, in comparison to other similar species of us that have uh, more common ancestry, like the chimpanzee, um, them developing um, more of, of their jaw and facial features and stuff like that, but not developing their skulls themselves. Um, as we compare it to them, in relative to them, then um, we still retain the juvenile features. Then. So, if I'm to understand that, it, it, it's kind of saying that humans don't necessarily, insofar as the brain, they don't necessarily retain their, their juvenile features. Yeah. But the process of the brain growing is a juvenile feature. You know, like okay. anything that's growing kind of thing is kind of a juvenile feature, right? Because when we're a child, we have to grow all the way until adulthood, right? For the chimpanzees, their brains do not grow um, as long as our brain develops kind of thing. Uh, our brain develops, continues to develop all the way through puberty and stuff, uh, while chimpanzees, they might end up stopping prior to even puberty occurs. So um, that's what I mean by it. it retains that feature of the brain growing to be a juvenile feature itself. So the growth itself is the feature? Yeah, the growth itself is the feature, the not the size of it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, while, while the skull itself, you could see how it's very similar, right, to the fetal skull and stuff like that. So that's not a juvenile feature either? That is a juvenile feature because it, we retain the same shape as the fetal skull. Okay, I think. Oh, okay, okay. And so it could be anything. It could be internal or external. It could be internal or external. It doesn't have to be one or the other. 
it just looks at different species amongst um, uh, that particular group or um, family kind of thing um, and seeing those adults in general compared to their um, juvenile uh, or uh, young I can't think of they're young basically yeah it's okay Yes, uh -huh. we're looking at it as for uh, how not just a particular species in itself, uh, but more like the an like common ancestor and beyond oh, kind of thing. About the tree, the yeah, uh -huh. the phylogenetic okay. tree. Um. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, fossil records. Remember what fossil record is? Yes, uh huh. The fossils that we find within the strata, right? The the different layers of rock. Um, so whatever fossils that we find, that will help us approximate the time of when the organism existed at that particular time. So it gives us uh, this geological uh, time scale. So different. Um, periods of our earth times uh, is uh, due to the rock uh, layers that we see. And there's different uh, of these um, time, uh, geo 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 <laughs> geological times, yeah. And you'll notice that in between each ge ge <laughs> geological time period, um, there's these mass extinctions that are involved. And these mass extinctions usually extincts uh, a particular dominant species, but then uh, there's some other species that uh, are survivors, and then they become the dominant species themselves. Yeah, exactly. So, and we talked about this, I think it was Gina that asked about how we dated things back in time. Um, and it's through this radiometric dating. And we talked about how there's different isotopes, right? Different amounts of neutrons in particular atoms. Um, one is uh, they're looking at the carbon, as we set, talked about before, how carbon-14 is more the more radioactive version compared to the more common carbon-12. And they look at that ratio between carbon-14 and carbon-12. And um, as an organism dies, the ratio of that carbon-14 and carbon-12 differs. The carbon-14 is not as stable as carbon-12. As carbon and so they'll lose the amount of carbon-14 that they have the longer that they've been dead. Um, so you'll notice that the half-life of carbon-14 is around 5,600 years. So if we end up having half the amount of um, carbon-14 compared to carbon-12, then we know that that organism has been around 5,600 years ago. Yes? No? Does that make more sense? <laughs> okay. Uh, First of all, I guess, okay, how much protons are in carbon? Does anybody remember? This, no, it's eight. I, yeah. It's six? Yeah, you're right, you're right, it's six. You got it right, I got it wrong. Yes, yeah, C6, okay. Uh, it's nitrogen... No, oxygen is eight. That's why. Okay, so um, so they have six, and if it's carbon fourteen, how much neutrons are there? Eight. Yeah, there's eight neutrons in carbon fourteen. Uh, how about carbon twelve? Six. Okay. So this are th that's an uh, carbon fourteen is an isotope, meaning that it's the same atom but different amounts of neutrons. Uh, and this isotope is more radioactive. 
Uh, and if being radioactive is less stable, so you tend to lose more of carbon-14 than carbon-12 over time. Okay, uh, There's a half-life of this carbon-14. Since it's getting lost at a greater rate than carbon-12, um, it, its half-life is 5,600 years, meaning that uh, half of it has dissipated over 5,600 years. Of course, if you're doubling that, you know, 5,600 times 2, so about um, 12, what? 11.2, uh, thank you. 11.2, uh, 11,200 years. Uh, that means that now only a quarter of it is available compared to carbon-12. So you, yeah, go ahead. On the fossil itself. Uh -huh. um, so that's how you're able to date things uh, back. Yeah, uh -huh, exactly. So if you have that ratio between carbon-14 and carbon-12, the amount of carbon-14 that's still present in that fossil will show you how far in time that uh, organism was alive. Uh, carbon-12 is more stable, so it tends to not, it, it most likely won't deplete uh, unless it's long, long, long. I mean, even carbon-14, as you can tell, it's not as stable, but yet it still lasts a long time, yeah. So. Paris, was that better? Yes. <laughs> Were you paying attention? No. <laughs> <laughs> Plate tectonics. Okay, so we've all heard of this probably through elementary school and whatnot, but the Earth's crust is made out of these plates that floats on the mantle itself. And that's why we have earthquakes, volcano eruptions, and mountains that form due to these plates colliding against each other. About 250 million years ago, uh, Pangaea is when the land masses actually, these plates actually were all linked together. Um, so be prior to this time, they were kind of separated and then um, they end up forming together. And once they form into this big land mass as shown over here, um, it caused a lot of extinctions to uh, be occur because now we have a lot of land animals competing over the same resources. Uh, all of these land animals that were separated before all now are in the same area. Not only that, it's also caused new diversity as well. Um, and we'll talk about how some of the uh, water levels tend to drop and a lot of organisms at that period of time tend to be more water-dwelling um, uh, organisms. During the mid-Mesozoic uh, era, this is when the Pangaea starts to split. And when it splits, it causes more isolation to occur. And that's where how the marsupials are developed uh, in Australia, as you can see over here, uh, from Pangaea to this uh, mid-Mesozoic era. This portion of it and part of it is uh, Australia. Uh, it's broken off from the main uh, land mass. And, uh, and that's why these mammals are very similar. They're mammals like us. However, uh, the, the way that they um, harbor their child is not in their uterus. It's uh, through their sac. Um, um, through these <laughs> yeah, their pouch. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. they're formed in the pouch. So we're formed in our uterus, right? Well, not our uterus, but the the <laughs> female's uterus. Um, while while uh, these form in their pouch, yeah, instead. And we talked about mass extinctions already, but mass extinction is when we have greater than 50% of all the species um, become extinct. There's been five so far in Earth's history. Uh, one of the, 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 there's two of them that you'll need to know. The one is this Permian mass extinction. 
And this is due to that formation in Pangaea again. Before they were, uh, were separate land masses, but during Pangaea, they form into one large mass. And like I said before, uh, it's when all these separate lar uh, land animals now start to compete with one another. And also, uh, there's this decrease in sea levels that will end up um, causing a lot of the sea life to be destroyed. And at this period of time, a lot of the organisms were uh, sea-dwelling animals or organisms. Also, the other one that I want you to know is the end of the Cretaceous period, and this one's the more famous one where uh, we have the extinction of dinosaurs. So at, uh, at that period of time, the Cretaceous period, the dinosaurs ruled the Earth, but uh, and the m and mammals were really small and very few. But at the end of it, uh, when the dinosaurs became extinct, the mammals then took its uh, place. Uh, the dinosaurs actually, their ancestors are the birds themselves. Classification. Okay, so we're switching topics. Classification is how we identify uh, and name specific species. So there's this thing called taxonomy where we actually have this naming process. Uh, it's usually using this binomial, uh, binomial meaning two, uh, nomial meaning names, two part name. So uh, it's usually in Latin, and usually when you write it, it's italicized, as you can see over here. All these are italicized. Yeah, when we were doing the invasive species and stuff like that, and I wanted you guys to name this genus and species, this is what we're, uh, we were doing. The genus is the first part of that name, so the first name uh, is usually capitalized, as shown over here. All these have capitalized uh, genus. The species is lowercase though, so um, it's the second name here, and it's lowercase. Example, Homo sapiens, that's a uh, name for us, humans. And the way that they classify it uh, is through, we already talked about domains before. There's three domains that uh, you guys should know already, so hopefully you still know. The archaea uh, and bacteria, which are both what kind of cells? Pro pro prokaryotic cells. And then there's the eukarya, um, which are eukaryotic cells domain. And um, when we're talking about eukaryotes, uh, they are broken down into kingdoms. Uh, there's the different types of kingdoms that we talked about before, the uh, animalia, which we're part of, plantae, which is the plants, uh, fungi, um, fungus, and the protista, which are the protists. And uh, if you're going to become more specific, then we go into phylum, then go on to class, order, family, genus, and finally species. Okay. There's mnemonics for this. You can always look up uh, on the online uh, as to what type of mnemonics you won't prefer to um, be able to have this classification remembered. King Philip came over for green spinach. Uh, yeah, there's some funny ones online too. So. Phylogenic trees, uh, this is help us hypothesize the evolutionary process or of a species uh, and how they also relate to other species as well. And they use uh, fossil records, homology, and molecular biology. This is all uh, things that we talked about in the last lecture. And since these high, uh, phy <laughs> phy phylogenic trees are hypotheses means that uh, it's constantly being revised or uh, corrected whenever um, we find more information through the fossil records or molecular biology or homology. And at one time, um, birds were not classified as being an ancestor of the uh, reptiles. Um, they were classified in its own category, but as we um, have more and more information, 
about uh, birds themselves and about their ancestral history, we now classify them amongst uh, the as a descendants of the dinosaurs here. Homology, we should already know. This is where we have similarities between different species, similar structures, usually because we have a common ancestor. However, analogy is a little different. This is when we have completely different species that come from completely different um, ancestors, yet they have similar structures uh, due to this uh, term called convergent evolution. Convergence evolution meaning that uh, the species, they converge um, in forming these same structures in this particular case. So an example of this is how we have wings on a butterfly and also wings of a bird. <laughs> and remember how we use starting to use molecular biology in helping us understand phylogenic, uh, phylogenic uh, trees and stuff. Um, so we use the DNA and see how our DNAs are similar to other species and how we're related. Um, and so that uh, the more similar we are uh, with our genetic material, uh, the more common of an ancestor we might have. Uh, of course, uh, the best is to have a combination of all of these, uh, which are, once again, which fossil records, homology, and this molecular biology. Yes, very good. Cladistics, uh, this is when we end up grouping organisms due to a common ancestry. And clay in itself is when we have uh, an ancestral species and all its descendants afterwards. And that's it for this particular. Oh, sorry. It went too fast. So a cladistic is very similar to a phylogenic tree. They're basically almost synonymous with each other. Yeah, we'll go into reprojection next.